The Pearson Connolly Fife and Drum Band originated in Butte, Montana in 1917. At that time, Butte was a hub of the Irish diaspora in America. It was a major mining town. As David Emmons notes, who is a re the renowned historian of the Butte Irish, in population, production, and size of workforce, it had no rivals among mining cities anywhere in the world. It also bore the distinction of having a higher population of Irish in 1900 than any other American city. This population, which had been arriving in small numbers in Butte since after the famine, accelerated in the 1880s and 1890s. Marcus Daly from Bally James Duff, County Cavan, a miner who went to Butte to manage a mine, ended up purchasing the Anaconda Mine himself in 1880. Irish immigration to Butte increased in the 1880s and 1890s as a result of the development of the mines, and some say because of the presence of Daly himself as a visible and incredibly successful Irish mine owner. As a result of growing arrivals of Irish immigrants, an enclave formed with many thriving associations. Many of this generation of immigrants settled in Butte and created a home there. A new wave of Irish immigrants, however, started to arrive that were characterized by a different set of experiences and expectations. As David Emmons notes, the Butte they entered in 1906 or 1916 was not the same town it had been 20 years earlier. It was a much harsher place for an Irishman. The Butte of 1912 resembled other Western mi mining towns more than it did the Butte of 1892. Two layers of change that added to this changing Butte were the changing landscapes of Irish politics and labor conflicts. The two often collided. The Easter 1916 rising against the British occupation of, of Ireland was a turning point in Irish history that had impacts far across the Atlantic, including in Butte, Montana. As AOH State President, um, Ancient Order of Hibernians State President J.G. Cummings told the Montana Convention, the Hibernians are the Irish who fight. They are the soldiers, the men in the, in the forefront. But the AOH was not generally interested in the radical uh, potential for militant labor activity as espoused by James Connolly, a leader of the Rising. That potential was focused by James Larkin, an Irish trade union leader and social activist who lived and organized in the US from 1914 to 1923 and made three trips to Butte during that time. Um, he was aided in spreading this message to Butte by another Irish socialist, Con Lehane. After Lehane's visit and before Larkin's return to Butte for the third time, a new Irish organization showed up called the Pierce Connolly Irish Independence Club. It was most attractive to the younger generation of Irish immigrants, many of whom were suspicious of the conservatism of the AOH. This new group, um, ro this new group rose up in Butte, animated by changes in Ireland, as well as in Butte. As Emmons notes, quote, Butte offered no promise of a fair living to these younger ones. By 1916, it was just another industrial town filled with boarding houses, hazardous jobs, and roving gangs of unskilled disposable workers. Larkin and the Pierce Connollys appealed to the unsettled Irish because Butte's Irish enclave had no room for them and because their work was unsteady, safe, and paid too little to allow them to return to Ireland or to bring a part of Ireland to them. One thing that Emmons doesn't account for here, and that comes up in the recording that I made of Dan McCormick in conversation with my father, Eugene McPeak, in 1988, is the presence of actual participants in the 1916 Rising in Butte and in the formation of the Pierce Connolly Club. According to Dan McCormick, many of those who came from Butte to San Francisco were veterans of the Rising. So if we take that into consideration, this population becomes another layer in understanding the reason why a new organization sprang up at, in Butte at this time, one explicitly interested in, Republican, in the Republican and socialist heritage of the rising, and one that was not interested in shying away from conflict and making manifest the ideals of, the socialist, of that socialist heritage in Butte. This interest in both sides of the revolutionary inheritance led almost immediately to conflict with the established Irish community in Butte. St. Patrick's Day 1917 came on the verge of the US declaring war with 
uh, Germany. This was a major issue for the Irish, who were not interested in supporting a war in which the US was an ally with England. In this context, Emmons notes, there is no record of what it was the Pierce Connollys wanted to do, what the theme of the parade would be. Mayor, Mayor Charles Lane, however, thought he knew their purpose. He denied the Pierce Connollys a parade permit, saying that it was an IWW affair, an indication that the Pierce Connollys were seen as more than just another group of Irish merrymakers. The parade proceeded in defiance of his orders. AOH and, um, had been invited to participate, and many of the Emmets and Irish volunteers, some in uniform, seemed to have done so, though the R-E-L-A, the Robert Emmett Literary Association, accepted the invitation, quote, only conditionally. But the Hibernians in Division Three, in a tersely worded note, answered for thousands of conservative Irish when they, quote, turned down the invitation of Pearson Connolly Club to parade, announcing instead that, quote, we are going to mass, unquote. So the Irish establishment in Butte started to split with the Pierce Connollys, a move that continued when they staged another parade just after St. Patrick's Day, in which 750 people participated and about which establishment Irish leaders were not consulted. Anti-war sentiment came to the fore after a national draft registration order was made on June 2nd, 1917. The following day, two men described as young Irishmen, recent arrivals, were arrested for distributing anti-draft pamphlets in Butte, a pamphlet that included the phrase that men were being asked to fight in a war to, quote, aid the nation that had riveted the chains of slavery around Ireland, unquote. The Pierce Connolly Club took credit for the pamphlet, and two of its officers, James Trainer and John Lennon, were also arrested. In addition, on June 5th of 1917, the Pearson Connolly Club led a large anti-draft protest march, which ended in what's described as a small riot. Within the same week, the Pierce Connollys were involved in the formation of the Metal Mine Workers Union on June 5th in response to the draft order. That week, the spe speculator mine fire claimed the lives of 165 miners of the 410 men who went to work on that night shift. Charles Stevens, a reporter for the Anaconda Standard, stated, quote, leaders of the PC club were also the leaders of the IWW in Butte. This is something that Emmons doesn't agree with. He considers an overstatement. Nevertheless, the Pierce Connollys were the most visible target during the years of World War I, and their anti-war stance was coupled with labor activism. As Emmons notes, um, um, the, the Pierce Connollys did more than just share offices with the Miners Workers Union and the IWW. They supported the strikes of 1917 and 1918 and ensured that their members would be blacklisted by joining Fran L Frank Little's funeral cortege. And um, Little was a labor leader, a member of the IWW, who was lynched for his union and anti-war activities in Butte in August of 1917. As a result, the organizations filed were confiscated by federal authorities, its, off, its officers, quote, roughed up by company thugs. This visibility had consequences for their profile in the Irish community. In 1918, the Pierce Connolly Club um, asked Captain Omar Bradley in charge of US peacekeeping in Butte for permission to parade. Um, Bradley agreed to allow them to parade as long as it was not quote-unquote unpatriotic, yet the mayor of Butte rescinded that permission. Um, and they, in 1919, that um, separation from the Irish establishment continued. Uh, I have a, a picture of it here. Uh, they... Uh, issued a statement in the Butte Daily Bulletin on March 14, 1919, reporting that they would not be marching in the parade be because uh, it was not uh, granted, they were not granted a permission from the mayor, quote, unless they join the Hibernians. This is a direct quote from the statement. And this they absolutely refused to do. The Hibernians heretofore have been averse to the stand the Pierce Connolly Club has taken in demanding equality and justice for all liberty-loving people. 
Um, no later than last year, they approached the mayor and influenced him to prevent the Pierce Connolly men from parading on that day. So you can see a continuation in this, in this split. As a result, the Pierce Connolly Club staged its own parade that invited, quote, all returned soldiers and sailors and lovers of liberty uh, uh, invited to join in. 1919 was also the year that de Valera, an American-born leader of the Irish Rising and the only commandant of a battalion who was not executed on account of his American birth, visited Butte, Montana um, as president of Sinn Féin. Um, and as reported in the Butte Daily Bulletin on July 25th, um, thousands of marchers are expected to be in line including a large detachment of soldiers, sailors, and Marines in uniform, prominent among which will be the Pierce Connolly Club with its drum corps and delegates from various fraternal labor and industrial organizations. The following year, 1920, was the year of a strike that would change the fortunes of labor in Butte. Um, on April 19, 1920, a strike was called in the mines around Butte and it was abruptly ended when gunfire erupted at a picket in the Never Seat Mine on April 21st. Company security guards opened fire, wounding 15 and killing one. All had been shot in the back. And even though all but one were strikers, the company blamed the IWW for the violence and federal troops arrived the next day to impose martial law and end the strike. On May 12th, the company banned all members of the IWW from working in the mines. Um, oh, so this is, sorry, that's, that, that's the, uh, the uh, Daily Bulletin piece showing the arrival of uh, De Valera. And this is a picture from the Anaconda Standard in 1922 showing the um, arrival of Countess Markiewicz on April 29th, and beside her is Kathleen Barry, um, who is the sister of Kevin Barry, um, who'd been executed in 1920. Um, Pearson Connolly was still in Butte for Markievicz's visit in 1922, right before the start of the Civil War. Uh, uh, and just to give you a sense of Pearson Connolly's perception or profile in the community at that time, you know, what she says, um, and I think Mary McCormick pulled this out as well in your, in your history, that Butte was one of the places that stood out for its reception. They met us with a band and an army, and uh, it wasn't a band and an army. It was, it was the Pearson Connolly Fife and Drum Band, but it just appeared like an army. Okay, and now I'm gonna play you the first of a series of clips from a conversation, a recorded conversation that I had with uh, Dan McCormick, the um, grandfather and great-grandfather of uh, many in the band now, and, and also with my father, Eugene McPeak. So this was recorded in 1988, and um, he's gonna tell us about uh, what was happening when the band moved to San Francisco. Well, I see they had a, a strike on the copper mines up there. And actually the band had nearly all men working in the copper mines that were Irish. Really? Yeah. Original. Yeah. So anyhow, the... the uh, protested the, the war, and uh, they called in the National Guard, and the first thing you know, they were all, uh, a lot of them were arrested and put in prison, and then they were confined to their homes, they couldn't come out in the streets, and they had to behind them. So the only thing that they were able to do in Jit Montana was leave and come to San Francisco. So the men that were in the band, uh, 
I think there were some, maybe 40 of them all together. All came to San Francisco. And uh, they had uh, some beefs amongst themselves when they, when they went back to work in the mines when the pickets were on. Some of the Irish went back. But they were all kind of pinpointed here and marked as, as scabs afterward. It was always brought up to them in the strikes here, didn't you scab in Butte, Montana? But none of the band members was on that beef. It was all private guys that had to leave there because of it. the mines that closed down. It's kind of hard to put that all in, in writing, you know, because they did object to the country going to war. And, uh, they, they did demonstrate and, uh, that. Uh, I think as a lot of them couldn't even get their citizen papers out there, it could happen. Uh, All righty. So, um, you know, the memory is alive and well for Dan McCormick about the, you know, the serious uh, outcomes uh, for the band of of this activity in this time period. Emmons suggests that, just briefly, that, that the Pierce Connollys, once they arrive in San Francisco, are actually working in collaboration with the IWW directly um, when, they, when they had been suspected of, of doing so in Butte. Um, it's nothing I can corroborate, but it's, a, it's a, something that Emmons claims. Um, I'm going to play you another clip from McCormick who gives us a sense of how the club existed alongside of the band as it came to San Francisco, um, and kind of the, the composition of, uh, of, of the groups and... and well, that was that they, the club themselves were strictly veterans since 1915. So if we took in everybody from the street, we would only bust it up the, the club because he would have then turned it into some kind of a political deal. The thing I think that the band, the band in no way could claim that this was the first Conley out that had to carry the club, or the club carried it more than that. Yeah. The language in there, I think, writes that all up. I'll have to find that in the next day or so here when I get off my hands. Uh, but you could, uh, you could be a member of the band. And uh, one thing that the club would not stand for, if you were in the Free State Army, you couldn't. You, you couldn't wear the uniform. I would say so. <laughs> so the they took, restriction. They took the uniform off a guy down in the, in the water pump right in the front of the hole. <laughs> <laughs> what you can, I don't know if you can hear it too quickly, and I apologize for the quality of the audio clips here, um, but. Uh, you could not be a member of the band if it had been identified that someone was a member of the Free State Army. And so McCormick is saying that there was a one person for whom that knowledge, when it was uncovered, resulted in him being stripped publicly of the band's um, uniform um, when they were performing, presumably. Um, Dan McCormick himself um, joined the band in 1932 when he says that uh, a man from County Down by the name of Joe McNulty was running it. He also names others of what he calls the original guys, 
um, in other words, those who had come from Butte, including Packy Doherty, the O'Neill fight, the O'Neill brothers, Dennis Scannell, um, old Ed McGovern, uh, as he calls him, and others. And he says that the band had about 30 members in those days, um, but that they would always be down about five or six since you had, quote, had to get work wherever you could get it. Um, in addition to playing in the parades and attending community commemorative events, uh, such as going to the grave of Father York, the band also participated in picnics. And um, I thought that I would play you a, a final clip here about the picnics because it seemed like it was such a fun outing for, for everybody involved. Oops, sorry. Here we go. The picnic started up about, oh, maybe 28 or 29. And uh, we used to, when I was at the first picnic up there, I think it was the third of the week. You took the streetcar or your car down to the ferry boat, and then you rode across from the ferry boat, which also you did, and then you took the train to the picnic. Really? And there was a, an outdoor mass on the picnic ground. So the whole thing settled in. You, you started out here at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Down to the ferry building, and you danced and sang all the way over on the ferry boat, and then you got on the train and you sang all the way to the picnic. <laughs> when what a day. the train pulled in, you got out and got all the crumbs and got the rotation, and you marched up a couple of blocks to the picnic ground. When you got in there, so that gives you a sense of what a big, you know, first of all, how hard it was to get up the country and out of the city and how it really was, you know, the party started essentially immediately upon, you know, exiting, you know, entering, exiting San Francisco. Um, so that's just a, a short snippet of some of the, the activities that band members were involved in. Um, just quickly, you know, World War II had a very negative impact on the band. Um, McCormick tells us that they got nine or ten, you know, nine or ten of the guys um, were en uh, enlisted, and that after the war there were missing members and people were getting married and, and moving away. Um, I'm not entirely sure if there was a stoppage of the band at this point or not. Um, he talks about a reorganization of the band happening in, in 56. Um, and this happened simultaneous to a huge influx of immigrants in the 1950s from Ireland, the second largest wave of immigration into the U.S. in the 20th century. And uh, that came to be known as the 50s generation. Um, and those that included my father, um, as well as... Um, other other folks by the name of John Devine, Joe McHugh, Pete Laffey, Bill Farrell, Tom Riley, um, uh, from various places that really provided a shot in the arm to band membership at that time. Um, and you know, somebody like my father, who came from Tyrone in the north, had experience in playing in fife and drum bands in Northern Ireland, where fife and drum is is a big part of the tradition. And so he, uh, you know, they, they also benefited from people who were coming from Ireland who had a variety of expertise and experience as well. In addition, the band benefited from an, um, an influx of new recruits, uh, which are called in this conversation between Dan McCormick and my father, natives, which I, which I think is interesting, or in other words, meaning American-born people. Um, 
And I'll just play you a tiny bit of this, this clip on new recruits. Up to that point, you were the main source of uh, teaching, mostly I, I the drum core and, uh, and, and a lot of the music you taught. Oh, yeah. Up I, through there. Yeah, because I got all those little Potter kids started on the music, first of all. And uh, uh, some of them were going to school and you know, they were learning the music. But we got different fights because they wanted uh, to use the low scale, the body gear, you know, yeah. the alto type uh, pipe. And uh, they got to fight the box themselves. But finally, Pat Cotter became good. Uh, he was dealing with the orchestras here and there, you know, and he got the music. He could read and write music better than anybody, and uh, he got them more or less on the right scale, so everybody, no matter who came in, they were able to play right away. <coughs> I saw them little... <coughs> oh, sorry. Um... So as the beneficiary, I, I myself learned how to play from Pat Cotter, and many, many, many in my generation in the band were, uh, were beneficiaries of, of his work. Um, and so you had a, an enlivenment of the band in the 50s and 60s. And I found as I was poking around my, my, my parents' uh, a uh, collection of photos. I found a few photos from the 60s here that I thought are interesting to look at. Um, this is clearly from a parade, um, taking a break during the parade. Um, this is from an advertisement in a GAA program in 1962 uh, when the County Down team, the All-Ireland Champion team, was visiting San Francisco. Uh, uh, this is from the late 60s, I would say, um, and you can see that wonderful hat and tie in the uniform. We have a very old uniform courtesy of the McGoverns in the back of the auditorium today. Another, another. this is from March of 1968. So the 60s were, I think, a really rejuvenated um, time for the band. And then in the 1970s, there was a huge influx of, of children, myself included, and girls. So for the first time, the band had female members starting in the 1970s. Um, also in the 1970s, the, ba the band's position as a representative of Irish republicanism became more central to its identity. The conflict in the North that erupted in the 70s produced organizations in the United States in response. Four months foremost among these was Irish Northern Aid. The band marched in front of Irish Northern Aid in the, in the St. Patrick's Day Parade all during this period, and the band continues to march as part of the Republican movement. Um, in other words, a group supporting unification with Northern Ireland today. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Mary, Mary McCormick McLaughlin.